Hey everybody and welcome back to NeuroPsyQ for another episode of Neuroscience ABCs. In today's video we're going to be discussing something that links to last week's video and that is dopamine. So today's topic for Neuroscience ABCs is D is for dopamine. Stay tuned and we'll tell you all about what dopamine is and its role in the nervous system. So, as I said earlier, today's video is all about dopamine. First of all, we want to look at the question of what dopamine is. Dopamine is actually known as 3,4-dihydroxyphenethylamine. And this name comes from its chemical structure. We get the hydroxy part from the two hydrogens on the molecule, the amine part from this amine group, and the phenol from the fact that there is a phenol ring in the center. But that's only of interest if you are interested in organic chemistry. In terms of dopamine's role in the nervous system and its definition in neurosciences, Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, and a neurotransmitter is basically a chemical messenger. So what dopamine does is relays messages from one neuron to the other at the synapse. In simpler terms, what we have is basically a bunch of cells in our brain trying to communicate with one another, but they're not directly connected. So the way they get the message across is by sending molecules to each other, and each molecule actually encodes a signal and tells the cell something. So a lot of these messages include information for motivation, for planning, and for different aspects of thinking. Importantly for motivation, it has to do with motivational salience, so the amount of salience attached to maybe a carrot compared to a cupcake. But on top of that, there are three important pathways in our brain that require dopamine. These three dopaminergic pathways include the mesocortical dopaminergic pathway, which connects the ventral tegmental area to the prefrontal cortex, along with the mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway that connects the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens, and finally, the nigrostriatal dopaminergic pathway that connects the substantia nigra to the striatum. These three pathways have different roles, the mesocortical being important for cognition and working memory, the mesolimbic for motivation, and the nigrostriatal for movement. The mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway is important for learning in that it attaches incentive salience to stimuli in the environment. So for instance, we talked a little bit about classical conditioning in other videos, but if you're trying to learn a par conditioned paradigm, you have to be able to attach importance to the proper signal. For instance, if a light comes on to signal a food reward, you have to be able to realize that that light is important. And it was seen that dopamine is responsible for this attachment of importance to a signal. The way they came to this conclusion is by looking at what happens if we get rid of dopamine cells in the brain. So scientists performed what is called a lesion using 6-hydroxydopamine, which selectively lesions dopaminergic neurons. They did this in rats, and what they saw is the rats that had the lesion weren't able to learn the conditioned task, as well as the rats who had a sham lesion, which means a lesion in another area. When the lesion was in the nucleus accumbens, which meant the mesolimbic dopaminergic system was damaged, the rats with the lesion performed worse on the conditioned paradigm. In fact, if you look at the graphs, they actually didn't learn to associate the signal of the light with the food reward at all. Another study that was done looked at single cell recordings of dopaminergic neuron activity within the brain. And what they saw was that in monkeys performing a go-no-go -go task in which certain stimuli signaled a reward and other stimuli didn't signal a reward, dopamine was actually related to the surprisingness of a stimuli. Now, when it comes to learning tasks, there's actually an equation that helps to look at the rate of learning and the predictive value of a stimuli. 
So we can calculate predictive value, which is represented by delta v, by looking at some constant multiplied by v minus lambda. Now, I know math might not be your favorite thing, but basically the v minus lambda is a term that indicates surprisingness of a stimuli. And the more surprising a stimuli is, the more dopamine is going to be released. So, for instance, if you have a light turn on, and it's a very bright light, that might be very salient or very prominent, and that will cause dopamine release. Dim lights maybe aren't paid as much attention to. Now, in terms of the task that the monkeys were doing, dopamine was released both with the stimulus and with the reward. And what they saw is that the most dopamine was released when the monkeys got an unexpected reward. was when the monkeys got an unexpected reward. If the monkeys were supposed to be rewarded, but they didn't receive a reward, there was a decrease in activity of the dopaminergic neurons. And if the monkeys got the signal and the reward, there were normal dopamine release within the brain. Now, first of all, this doesn't happen from the start. For instance, if a light turns on, it's not going to automatically cause dopamine release. But once that light is associated with a reward, that light becomes what? The light is actually what's going to cause dopamine release. So for instance, at the beginning, a light turns on. There will be no dopamine activity. As soon as there is a reward, that's when there are spikes in dopamine levels. Now, after time, that light actually causes dopamine release and the reward, not so much. And this is why dopamine in the mesolimbic pathway is more associated with motivation rather than pleasure. Because it's not actually responsible for the pleasurable feeling, it's rather responsible for motivation to complete a task. So for instance, the light's now signaling food, which will motivate the rat to go eat. The other important role dopamine has in the nervous system is for proper movement. And there's actually a disease called Parkinson's disease, which happens when dopamine levels are lower than usual. This disease can be treated with L-DOPA, which is a precursor to dopamine. What this means is that L-DOPA can be turned into dopamine. So, if you increase the amount of L-DOPA in the body, you can increase the amount of dopamine in the brain. The reason why they have to use L-DOPA is because dopamine can't actually cross the blood-brain barrier. So, if you were to inject dopamine into your blood, it wouldn't get to the brain, which is where it is needed for the function. L-DOPA, however, can cross the blood-brain barrier, and once it's within the brain, it can be turned into dopamine, which allows it to effectively treat Parkinson's. Now, the way the negrostriatal pathway works is that dopamine plays a role in this very intricate interaction of the cortex, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and back to the cortex. So this is a sort of loop that is in charge of our movement. The way this works is that there's a direct pathway from the striatum to the substantia nigra and then from there to the thalamus and this is the direct pathway which then goes to the cortex and the cortex then causes movement. The indirect pathway goes from the striatum to the globus pallidus external to the subthalamic nucleus and again to the thalamus and then the cortex causing again movement. Dopamine's role in all of this is that dopamine actually can excite the striatum. And so dopamine through exciting the striatum will allow the striatum to inhibit the substantia niagara. And through this inhibition, the substantia niagara will then no longer be inhibiting the thalamus. We've talked about how this is called a release from inhibition. So the thalamus is released from inhibition, which means that the thalamus can excite the cortex and lead to movement. It inhibits the indirect striatal pathway, which actually 
causes the globus pallidus external to be released from inhibition. So the globus pallidus external is no longer inhibited, which means that it can now inhibit the subthalamic nucleus, which means the subthalamic nucleus is no longer activating the substantia nigra. And so the substantia nigra is no longer inhibiting the thalamus, again causing the thalamus to excite the cortex, leading to movement. So at the end of the day, dopamine is actually increasing movement. Whereas with Parkinson's, we have less dopamine and so movement is decreased. So what happens with Parkinson's is that there isn't enough dopamine. And so without dopamine, you actually have the inhibition of the brainstem. This inhibition of the brainstem and inability to release the cortex from inhibition leads to rigidity in movement and tremors that are seen as signs of Parkinson's. So at the end of the day, as you can see from the video, dopamine is basically a messenger in the brain to help relay signals that can be important for both movement and motivation. So even though you may have heard that dopamine is important for pleasure, it's actually more important for those two aspects we discussed today, being movement and motivation. Anyway, that's all for today's video. If you want, go check out our other video from last week about dopamine fasting. There's some more cool information in there. If you have any questions about today's topic or anything else neuroscience related, leave your comments down below. Make sure you like this video and make sure you subscribe. Turn on notifications so you get notified every time a new video comes out. Thanks for watching Neuroscience ABCs. Be sure you check out our other videos and click here to subscribe. Thanks for watching.